Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Jimenez and I want to show you our recharge version of PetRML, which now includes feature and quantity skew parts together with their quantification methods. In a previous video from the flower model that you can find on the YouTube channel, we mentioned that Tony Stark's greatest invention was Jarvis, his AI tool that helped him to solve problems in an easy, controlled and quickly way. Thus, our greatest invention so far is FedRML, which permits the creation of federated datasets from centralized ones, controlling the level of non IDs. And now we have included a feature and quantity skew partitions in our library. We have defined formally what we meant by a centralized dataset and distributed or federated datasets. And from there, we formally define label and feature uh, skew distributions which took uh, to the definition of label skew, feature skew, and quantity skew. And finally, we have introduced a Jensen Shannon distance and Hellier distance to quantify the level of non iidness in federated learning. Now let's see what are the new attributes that we have included in FedRML, and let's start from the feature skew. We have included the state-of-the-art Gaussian noise method, which introduces a defined level of noise to the features of the clients. Notice that this method has a drawback when sigma is too large, since the model's performance decreases drastically. To solve the issue of the previous technique, we implemented a brand new method called hist Dirichlet, which creates a histogram based on the average value of the features and assigns each example to a mean. From there, we just apply the Dirichlet distribution with a defined alpha to obtain the distribution of each client. Using our library, Flower, and the FishNet 2020 dataset, we made a comparison between the Gaussian noise and the His Dirichlet method, showing that with our new method, we do not damage the performance of the model, and also that high levels of feature skew do not decrease the result of the model. Now regarding quantity skew, in our library, we implemented the state-of-the-art method based on the Dirichlet distribution using the desired alpha. However, this method cannot be used when the data is too small or the number of clients is too big. Then as a solution, we propose the mean size Dirichlet-based method that defines a required minimum size that we want for the clients. And from there, we define the mean size at the minimum required size divided by the number of examples. If the proportions are already calculated for, for each client using the dedicated distribution R is smaller than, than our calculated mean size, we set that proportion equal to the value of mean size. Finally, we normalize the obtained proportion between zero and one. Using FedRML and Flower, we split our efficient dataset based on the quantity skew determine that the federated and centralized models have very similar performance, even increasing the level of non iidness So we can conclude that the Jensen, Shannon, and Hellinger distances are appropriate for quantifying the degree of non iidness of label, features, and quantity distribution among clients. Second, FedRML produces federated datasets starting from centralized data, facilitating a comparison of centralized and federated learning. Thus, as a consequence, the datasets are consistent and generated with a measurable level of heterogeneity. We are including methods to measure and simulate scenarios with a special temporal skew to have a more proficient version of our Jarvis. And we are using our tool to conduct a systematic and controlled comparison of aggregation algorithms such as FedProx, Moon, PetYogi, PetAdam, and all those based and implemented in Flower. Here you can find some of the references that we employed in the construction of PetRML. And that's it. This was a fast journey over our tool that we expect will be helpful for the future research path that we will continue. And of course, we hope that plenty of researchers will find it a great assistant. Please scan the QR code, play with the library, and let us know if we can do anything better. Hi, my name is Dennis Greenwald, and I'm a PhD student with the Machine Learning Group at the Technical University of Berlin and the Berlin Institute for the Foundations of Learning and Data, or in short, BIFOLD. 
And today I want to speak about our recent work on subspace training for federated learning. In our work, we consider the problem of statistical heterogeneity. This can be briefly grouped into the four following groups. We have label distribution school, that is the label distributions between clients might differ. Then we have the feature distribution school where the input features between clients might differ. For example, client one might draw his or her zeros differently than client two. Then we have the quality school where some clients might exhibit noisy data points. And we have the quantity school where, for example, some clients that are represented by big enterprises have a, a large amount of data points, whereas other clients that might be represented by edge devices have a comparable small amount of data points. And neural network subspace learning, uh, instead of training a single model until it converges to some local minima, in uh, subspace learning, we tried to train a higher, higher dimensional uh, simplices, for example, a one simplex that is represented by the line that connects two different random initializations of the same model. And we want to train this line in such a way that each point that we sample that lies on this line exhibits a low loss on our training data set. And we can do so by minimizing the following double expectation. So for each mini batch X, Y out of our training data set, we sample an alpha. Alpha corresponds to a point on the line, either uniformly or we can pick some other distribution. And then we want to minimize the loss on this mini batch using the alpha model that we've just sampled. Uh, and the loss might correspond to cross entropy, for example. And what we, what we end up with is such a line where the midpoint of the line actually outperforms standard training, standard training in terms of accuracy, calibration and robustness. And now, of course, since we have a whole space of models, we can sample multiple models to make a prediction and ensemble the predictions. For the case of a two simplex, this would correspond to such a triangle that is spanned by three different random initializations, for example, and we can minimize any point on that lies inside of this triangle. In our case, we want to use subspace learning for federated learning in such a way that we group clients to different groups or different regions within the simplex and the groups of clients are determined by their data distributions. So now clients that have similar data distributions should end up in the same regions of the simplex and sample models from this region. In this case, we grouped our clients into five clusters and uh, each client now gets assigned either the, the midpoint of a, such, a cluster, uh, such a cluster region or any other point that we can sample from this region. And what we show is that this yields a personal, improved personalized models for each client. And since we have a whole simplex of models, we can also sample either the midpoint of the whole simplex or an ensemble of models that fits the global test distribution really well. So in our case, we have tackled two problems of one, the problem of having a personalized model for each client and the well-performing global model for the global test data set. Uh, our method works the following way. First, of course, we need to define which client statistics we will use for clustering. Then we will project these client statistics into our simplex that we train. And in our case, we project it using latent Dirichlet allocation. Then given a certain distance function, we of course have to cluster within the simplex. We use uh, Hilbert simplex clustering for it. And um, once we have determined our cluster centers and the cluster regions, so every point within the simplex that belongs to a certain cluster center, we can, after projecting a new client, uh, assign to this client either the cluster center for inference or during training self sample multiple models uniformly, for example, out of this cluster region um, in order to train our simplex. We have evaluated our method against uh, several baselines on uh, uh, several different non-IID splits. So here we have the two-fold split, five-fold split, and different Dirichlet splits. For the two-fold and five-fold models, uh, we can see that SOSIC and SOSIC FL plus, which are our methods, um, strongly improve the baseline performance. For the Dirichlet, we also see an improvement of performance. So to conclude is that solution simplex learning allows to increase personalized and global performance at the same time, as we have seen. And uh, we can apply our method actually both on randomly initialized as well as pre-trained models where we just train the simplex over the last classification layer. For future work, we want to cluster our clients based on different statistics. We want to employ optimized ensembling techniques and we want to apply it to continual federated learning. Th thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Dmitry Kolopko. I'm going to talk about how federated learning enables data collaborations in genomics. 
while the use of federated learning in healthcare and genomics in particular looks very promising, it has been poorly investigated. Our team at Genext has recently published the first study that explores the efficacy of federated learning in application to large-scale genomic data. Let's start with a short introduction about genomic data and what we can predict from it. Genomic data is the information contained in our DNA. Our genome contains a lot of valuable data that, for example, helps us invent new drugs. The most direct use of genomic data in machine learning is to predict a phenotype. A phenotype, such as an illness, is an observable effect of the interaction of individual's genome with the environment. The goal of predicting phenotype from genomic data is to identify individuals more susceptible to a certain disease due to their genetics. These individuals can be monitored more closely to detect the disease at an early stage. In individuals of different genetic ancestries, phenotype can depend on different genetic variants, which means that phenotype predicting models trained on one population can poorly perform when tested on another population. The majority of genetic data comes from individuals of European descent, which means that models trained on this data perform poorly on individuals of other ancestries, which increases disparity in healthcare. Training a single model on multiple genomic data sets from different populations reduces this bias and makes phenotype from genotype predictive models more fair. On top of that, combining genomic data sets increases sample size, which leads to more accurate models. In increased sample size uh, also boosts statistical power, which allows us to add rare variants as additional features into the model and to predict rare diseases. Genomic data, however, is extremely sensitive and its leakage may lead to serious consequences. Due to this fact, uh, data custodians may not allow moving and merging genomic data, which means we cannot pull all of the data sets together at a single location and train a model. This creates an ideal scenario for federated learning. In order to investigate the efficacy of federated models on genomic data, we considered the UK Biobank dataset, which contains genomic and phenotypic data for more than 350,000 individuals. We split the UK Biobank dataset into 19 isolated nodes according to data collection centers and trained models predicting eight continuous phenotypes. We then trained centralized models on all data together, federated models on all nodes in, federa in federation, and local models on a single node with two types of data per processing. The y-axis of the graph shows R-square for observed versus predicted phenotype uh, reflecting model performance. The x-axis shows six of 19 local nodes sorted in increasing sample size and federated and centralized data. We can see here that for all eight phenotypes tested, federated models showed in green performed almost as well as centralized models in blue and consistently outperformed two types of local models shown in purple and orange. This suggests that federated learning can be used to successfully establish a collaboration between multiple genomic datasets to predict clinically relevant phenotypes such as diseases. Finally, to mimic the scenario where collaborating datasets are drawn from different population, we investigated the performance of federated models in the presence of high internode heterogeneity or clandestimilarity in federated learning terms. We split the 1,000 genomes dataset containing genomes of 26 human populations into five nodes according to sample superpopulation. Here on the graph, we see the performance of federated average strategy with different number of epochs in a communication round. This shows uh, that using more frequent communication between central server and the clients drastically increases the convergence speed by tackling client drift. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Yong Gyeong, and I come from Gachuan University. Today, I'll present about our federal SAMD silo solution. This is our scenario. First, each hospital collects patient data from the emergency room and forms a ready state set. Next, each hospital performs federated learning using FEDOS, our FL framework. 
the result of the execution appear as FL application. Our application is a critical care classifier. The application tells you how to respond in the emergency room depending on the patient's severity. The data set we used in the scenario is Redis data set, and this is uh, emergency room patient information collected from 172 hospitals. 100 hospitals randomly selected the clients were set as training, and the remaining 72 hospitals were set as test. <clears throat> We conducted an experiment comparing centralized learning and federal learning and an experiment comparing the results of only local training and federated learning. As a result, centralized, centralized learning showed the highest performance and an important indicator in the SAMD model is AUC, where over 80% Consider as a good model, but federated learning showed the month below the 80%. So to solve this problem, we created an algorithm called LMECS. LMECS is an algorithm that selects client by evaluating the performance of the local model. It is an algorithm for that first score the client and then Select only those clients whose scores are higher than the score set by the user. This is the source code we wrote. And we implement like this to the FL. And as a result of LMECS, the overall performance was very similar to centralized learning, and the AUC also increased to over 80%. So you can also see that the execution time has been greatly shortened. Lastly, let me tell you about our plan based on these results. We plan to create a dynamic adaptive client selection feeder and apply it to FedOps <clears throat> and apply it to FedOps. This is a feeder that automatically selects clients based on the local model performance and client's resource. We will use this to enable users to create models that are easy and performed well. My presentation is ended, so thank you for listening. According to a recent study, the Fortune 500 manufacturers lose a staggering one and a half trillion US dollar per year due to unplanned downtime. Because of that, predictive maintenance is a key element when it comes to the overall maintenance strategy. Predictive maintenance can roughly be categorized into two kind of models. There's the physical based model, where based on the physical understanding, you come up with a mathematical description. And then there's the data driven models, where based on empirical incidences, you try to predict future events. We discovered a hybrid approach where we created a mathematical foundation that can be applied to PID controllers. PID controllers are a feedback loop system. They are applied to vast areas in the industrial setting from the controlling of temperature in thermal components to motion controlling of robotics. Now the PID is a result of a linear equation where gains are multiplied with the different components of the PID, the proportional, the integral, and the derivative. These gains we can compute. We can use three consecutive equations of the PID, and then we have a linear system which we can use to compute the gains. We can compute these gains and then make statements about the system, whether it's working or not. And because these gains don't contain any information about the processing, we can actually centralize these gains using a federated learning approach. And then in the centralized system, we can compare gains of countless machines with each other and then find anomalies. This anomaly detection allows us 
to find components that aren't working the way they're supposed to. In practice, we have access to over 400 machines and we are able to analyze the heater band, which is a thermal component of machines. Now, in general, what we've seen is pretty much what we'd expect. The gain values of the PID controlling the thermal element are configured in the, at the installation phase of the machine. And afterwards, they're rarely changed. So in general, we have a normal behavior where given some noise in the data, the computer gain oscillates around the true value, the actual gain. There are, however, some components that we detect through this anomaly approach where we have an increase of the gain for the integral and then all of a sudden all gains together drop drastically. And actually when we analyzed that, we realized that the component has actually failed. We also realized another behavior where in general all the gains start to behave very erratic. In that case, there was actually a processing issue. This is a perfect example on how through this analysis we're able to detect issues with other components, processing issues, not just for the component that the PID is actually controlling. Applying this analysis to a large scale of real-world data made us confident that this can be an essential future approach for predictive maintenance.